Well, I've been a little bit of a topic in today. We're very excited today to talk a little bit about John Stevens joining in excess. And uh, John's been a, a topic we've got a lot of conversations over our last 182 episodes, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into him, his career, and just how all that came about, and just the evolution, I guess, uh, of how he exited the band as well. So looking forward to sharing that with you today. And also, too, B, we've got the return a little bit later of Pleasure and Pain. That's cool. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to hearing your 1998, I think we're at. Is that right? We are. We are. And B, I think this is like the era of music where I felt like music crossed the Rubicon, which sort of a, is sort of a lexicon sort of language for where music sort of just left and went <laughs> went in two different directions. I reckon there's, I reckon there's pre-1998 music <laughs> and post-1998 music. So I will share a little bit of that later with you. A lot of my pleasures. I'm going to throw a couple of painful ones in B. Yay, we like a bit of pain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but what's it time for? It's time for the news. All right, B, well, well uh, it's happy birthday to a couple of uh, things today. One is the new sensation single release is 36 years old. Obviously, it was... Uh, uh, on the 987 album, but the single came out at the end of March, early April of 1988, and proved to be a bit of a juggernaut for the band in many, many ways. Also, to be in the last seven days, it's uh, 32 years since the concert for life, and we've had a few little uh, uh, reposts of Michael doing that really, really cool interview um, about a week out from the concert for life. You probably posted during the week, didn't you? Yeah, the one of him in the in the field. Yes. Yes, he looks great, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah and it just yeah. you know, it's just a great interview. They're talking about. Coming down, supporting the charity. Uh, they're in the studio with Mark Opitz. And yeah, 32 years. And if you haven't listened to the episode on that, B, we did uh, that two years ago, didn't we? The 30th anniversary. Yes, that was so good. Go back and do yourself a favour if you missed out on that one. Also, too, big shout out to the Induct in Excess gang out there. They're doing a great job. And every week or two, they seem to be posting somebody out there who's highlighting, and I say in quotes, B, why isn't an excess in the Rock Hall of Fame? That makes no sense. <laughs> um, and the latest edition is a, a gentleman from YouTube called The Professor who uh, does a, a great little sort of 90-minute blurb about how good in excess are and why they should be in the Rock Hall of Fame. So thank you to The Professor and the Induct in Excess guys. Doing a great job B, there, Guy. Yeah, absolutely. Last night, B, I was watching a show on Australia called The Back Page and uh, Mrs. Pangilly, or as I should say, Kirk Beachley, <laughs> uh, his wife, Lane Beachley, the ex-seven-time uh, world champion uh, surfer, she was on the back page last night. Okay. A couple of little references to Kirk, but a cool interview on her own rights. Also, too, we've done a little bit of highlighting BF over the last few years of what we call reaction videos, haven't we, where people film themselves on YouTube hearing an NXS song for the first time. I find the ones the funniest is when it's sort of a 21-year-old African-American guy uh, and his girlfriend who are really into their hip-hop and their rap and their dance, and they, they hear like an in excess song for the first time. They are the funniest, I think, particularly when they, you know, they show the facial grooves and the manoeuvres and they hear that song. Uh, one that stands out to the Never Tear Us Apart and the What You Need one, where I, one of the young guys suddenly does air saxophone to Kirk. Um, there is one going around, uh, doing the rounds at the moment, by a guy called Schnoots, and I'll spell that, S-H-N-O-O-T-S, uh, sorry, T-Z, he does a reaction video. It goes for about 9 minutes 30. I would say his reactions aren't hugely reactive. He looks like a guy in his middle 40s who should have known that Devil Inside was a song uh, around at the time. Having said that, there is a wor- it is worth a, a, a watch there because um, he sort of uh, does vibe and gives some in- interesting insights on the song. Also, if I stick to the YouTube side of things, there's a lot of posts, B. I don't know if you've seen this in the last week. We do know that Giles Martin's done a lot of, uh, of the, well, I guess the ultrasound side of things, the, the listening side, plus the, the video HDs of some of the video clips for NXS, and they're now being simultaneously posted out on YouTube. So it's mainly a lot of the uh, kick, you know, songs. So uh, I do know the actual kick, you know, song that uh, got re-shot as a video there at Santa Monica and Venice Beach in, in uh, 2017 with a uh, Gary in cameo footage there. Plus, a lot of the skaters wearing NSS seamless. It's such a great film clip. Yeah. I do know that uh, uh, Giles Martin's remixed some of that audio, and it does sound fantastic if you do play it. Equally, there is uh, Mediate Mystif- Mystified Devil Inside that I think Giles has put his fingerprints over as well. So it is worth uh, having a look at those particular things. Take one step. Additional to that, B, uh, we want to give a shout out to many patron friend of the program who has released a book. Now, it is coming to a position now where you can order that book, I believe. Can you share with the listeners how and where they can find it and what the book's about? Yes. Well, the book, <laughs> the book is about In Excess and every track that In yep. Excess, the Ferris Brothers and Michael have um, produced 
Um, he's a proper deep dive. Yeah. He was inspired by our little program that we've got here. And yep. so it was really nice of him to um, ask permission to use a lot of stuff from, from us. He's a really good writer and you can find it on Amazon, but we will be putting it onto our website. If you look at books on our website, you'll be able to get the link there. But we'll be doing a post. I'm sure you've all seen it already. Manny was hyper excited and he sent me and Hayden a photo of it in the box and he ripped it open and there it was. So like, yeah, we were so excited for you, Manny. It was so cool. So he's written about every In Excess song actually written and recorded, you know, uh, A to Z there. So uh, I can't wait to read it because, um, you know, again, you know, it's still a band that, you know, you learn so many things about. So uh, we will get Manny B. Manny on very, very soon to talk about the book. Maybe we might better do something where we can, as I said, drive some sales towards uh, his platforms and our platforms and uh, make it a win-win for everyone. Yeah, very good. Last week, as you probably know, the Never Tear Us Apart uh, video, which was the uh, extra footage uh, shot there in pro Czechoslovakia at the time, was given a release. I think it's about five and a half minutes. And I do know, I think Matthew Marston did mention that some of that footage is that might have been available on the Kickflix video, but also there's a lot of footage there that has never been seen before either. But it's just so more cleaned up, isn't it? It's really yeah. vibrant and beautiful. And look, there's just so many cool little excerpts there and just some sort of different perspectives where the camera is and some loops there that are played. But I do want to highlight the articles in Billboard and also the articles in Q Magazine because credit to excess management, when this stuff comes out, they're very good at getting them out to probably two or three of the bigger publications in the world, Yeah, uh, which generally Billboard, Q, Rolling Stone are those ones to get to. So those articles do more justice to it. There's plenty of other articles around, but those two sort of platforms are the best ones to uh, get a few more anecdotes about it. Also, too, a couple of little shout-outs here, B. I did come across a little Kieran Gibbons snapshot there where... He was over in the US in February and he was touring and uh, playing New Sensation live there. So kudos to Kieran. You can see that on YouTube. Also, too, I listened to, uh, while I was at work today, I shouldn't say that too loudly, but uh, while I'm working, I put on John Lamoureux's uh, podcast there in the background. There's a little bit of inspiring music, but there's a gentleman called Peter Farnan, F-A-R-N-A-N. Now, he was the principal sort of songwriter and founder of Boom Crash Opera. They were a band that were quite big in Australia. Uh, New Zealand and some parts of the world. They had a top five hit in America with Onion Skin, which was more on the alternative rock charts. But they're in a situation uh, where, yeah, Peter does a two-hour interview there, but he talks a little bit about how they were sort of pivoted, you know, as the next In Excess and talked uh, quite a bit about touring with In Excess and the band and just Michael and um, just about how, you know, their label was trying to sort of pivot them as the next sort of, you know, In Excess, which both was a bit of a curse, but also a blessing to some degree. Mm-hmm. So it is worth a listen to John Lamoureux's The Hustle podcast for there. Also, too, B, you did come across a little bit of social news yesterday. A certain Ferris member got married yesterday. Is that right? Yes, it was um, Andrew's daughter, Josephine. Andrew got married? Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's daughter, right, okay. Andrew's daughter, Josephine. Well, it looked like it was over at the farm in, uh, I think it's just outside Tamworth, which is... Um, country, sort of New South Wales, um, on the going up to the border there of, of Queensland. But uh, yeah, it looked lovely. Just really humble, beautiful wedding. Yeah. Bit of a big beer barrel out with a couple of champagne. So yeah, it was good fun. Who was the musical actor of the debut? <laughs> Who knows? I only saw a few photos. It was very yeah, Did Andrew come and say, let me play something off my new country album? I don't even know if Daddy gave her away because there was no, no photos of Andrew right, or my leader. Yeah, yeah. So it was interesting, yeah. I don't know if you finished your news, but um, Elegantly Wasted came out this time in 1997. So how many years ago is that? Very true. Yep, the first week of April, 97. Also, to be the swing came out this time. Uh, 40 mm-hmm. years ago and I've got a little announcement to make the end of the show yep. it'll be interesting so absolutely uh, another couple of anniversary and the last one uh, we've got a little bit of a, a RIP here there's an RIP going out to a gentleman called Chris Cross now I just want to say for the listeners here it's not Chris Cross from the rapper uh, duo in the early 90s from America and it's not Christopher Cross okay who was the yacht rock sensation in the late 70s with hits like Sailing and Arthur's Theme and Ride Like the Wind this is a, a gentleman called Chris Cross from a band that you'd be familiar with B called Ultravox who wrote the beautiful song Vienna okay and unfortunately he passed away I think at 71 over the weekend uh, so RIP to him but for those that know Ultravox and the song Vienna do yourself a favour one of those majestic new wave uh, sent piece of the bit. era Can we- let's play a little bit of it <laughs> B, that's the news of the week. 
Hey, this is Tim Farris. Big shout out to Hayden and B. Also want to say hello to all the listeners and NXS fans. Thanks for listening. I love you, Hayden and B. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Thanks, Tim. And now it's time for Topic of the Week. All right, Bleed. Well, uh, very excited about this topic today. We're talking about John Stevens, and um, we're going to give John his due here. Uh, as many of you know, John stepped in to fill the breach of, of Michael uh, between 2000 and 2003 with NXS. And John's a guy that, uh, if I think back to his uh, you know prior career and his achievements there, really was a perfect fit to join NXS given the circumstances. And we're going to sort of flesh that out a little bit today. I guess as a bit of a backdrop, though, B, um, a lot of people don't know that John. He's had about sort of seven careers. If you actually look at his bio and look at Wikipedia and all those different things, he's had many, many incarnations. And, you know, I've got to admire, you know, his work ethic. He's, uh, I think, just turned 62, 63. He's just having a, a six, eight-week holiday. He's always touring. As a lot of you know, he's out there playing in excess of noise work songs, you know, recently. Uh, you just went to, to see him live. You know, the crowd there, you know, uh, he, he elicits a very passionate response from the crowd. And, you know, he's one of those guys that, when you break it all down, he's just one of the great guys of the rock and roll industry, isn't he? Humble, enthusiastic, positive, passionate, loves his craft. And we're going to sort of flesh some of those characteristics out a little bit today as, as to probably why and how those characteristics got him the gig in NXS, but also just, you know, his his career achievements. So, B, any sort of memories from the recent gig that stood out to you other than meeting him and giving him a hug, which I'm sure you did? Yeah, that was nice. His voice... It's just a pure rock star. And I don't know if you know, Hayden, about how he started to sing. Do you know that little ant? Well, you share with me and I'll see if I do know. See if you I'm know. Yeah. Well, him and his sister, I believe, were working at the EMI. Right. In a, in a, a plastics factory making yep. the vinyls. Yep. And he used to sing. And she says, wow, you're an amazing singer. And then that's where it all started, really. Yeah. He, his heritage and lineage is a combination of, of a Scottish heritage and obviously Kiwi heritage. Now, he's born in New Zealand. I don't know if his father was born in Scotland, but I believe he's, that's the father paternal side there. Mm. And his mother, you know, she was obviously born in New Zealand. So he's got this sort of Scottish, you know, Kiwi heritage, which is not uncommon. Scots definitely came out and plundered and came out to New Zealand many, many years ago. He was one of, I think, about maybe 10, 11, maybe even 12 siblings, B. So... What? Uh, yes, and he was probably uh, around sort of, I would say, you know, one of the younger ones of the siblings. But yeah, he's one of about 11, so, you know, had to learn the hard way and, and grow up tough and things like that. He, in about 1980, was uh, being pivoted as a little bit of a sort of a, a teen idol there in New Zealand. In fact, he was able to, uh, through the through the, the label there, uh, record a couple of hits. Uh, one was the cover, Montego Bay. Uh, which we all know is one of those classic party songs, and also another song called Jezebel, which uh, both hit number one. And uh, I think he was sort of like you know New Zealand's pop star of the year, and he was only eighteen or nineteen years old. And um, I guess he had a pretty sort of uh, heady or suspicious start. B. I think he knocked himself off the top, didn't he? He was number one, and then he put another song out, and probably song yeah. it became number one again. Yeah, and, and look, you know, eventually led, you know, to him probably like a lot of those sort of idols sort of being a bit disgruntled. You don't have to read to Bilanis Morissette, who was pivoted as one of those idols and then went away and then came back with Jagged Little Pill. But uh, he ended up moving over to Australia sort of around 84, 85, and he met a, a very important guy in his life called Stuart Fraser, who went on to become really his uh, songwriting cohort buddy from Noiseworks. But they're in a band called The Change, and through the influence of Michael Browning, who we've interviewed before, you know, discovered ACDC and In Excess and then... Noise Works, you know, what a what a triumvirate of uh, discoveries. Uh, Help, you know, shape, you know, the band Noise Works by putting the sort of the roster together with John. And Stuart and John then sort of proceeded to, to create Noise Works and then to their first album with the production talents of uh, Mark Opitz, which I guess for our listeners overseas, people probably think, gee, Australia's a pretty small industry. Well, well, it is from the music point of view. Everybody knows everyone and everybody's probably worked with everybody. But, you know, it was a strong industry, particularly in this era. And you know, Mark Opitz, you know, had come in from working with Cole Chisel and In Excess and was soon to work with, you know, the Hoodoo Gurus and many others um, and the Angels previously, went in to work, you know, with Noiseworks there. And the Noiseworks debut album was right in the sweet spot for me, B, as a uh, sort of a 15-year-old, sort of 16-year-old listener. And the song No Lies came out and then the second single, Take Me Back. Well, it was a double one-two punch and two massive big songs, anthems, real 80s. I wouldn't say 80s production because sometimes that, 
has almost like a feeling of datedness, but it was strong 80s production. It was fantastic Mark Opitz production that still stands up to the test of time. But that album had like six singles on it. It uh, had two or three other non-album tracks that were great. It, it was, uh, you know, multi-platinum selling. It was a really perfect time for the band. You know, the vibrant live scene was there. Uh, they could cut their teeth live. John, as we know, had a, a fantastic voice, uh, you know, and it still has a fantastic voice. You know, some artists lose their voice. You know, John hasn't. You know, effectively, it was a really good foothold for, for John and Noiseworks there in Australia, which for a lot of Kiwis, you know, coming to Australia was a big thing, but a natural step, like split ends, you know, from uh, Neil and Tim Finn, you know, three, four, five years earlier, you know, probably even longer, six, seven years earlier, came to Australia to, to make their footing a uh, Another band called Dragon, which was a massive band here, were originally a Kiwi outfit. Sharon O'Neill was another singer there who, you know, came over here. And, you know, Australia's a bigger market for the Kiwis. And John, you know, you know as I said, hooked up with the four other guys in Noiseworks to form a, a really, really strong band. Titan, I, I read that he's got a brother. Well, you've just told me he's got a load of siblings. Yes. And um, Frankie, who's Frankie? Yes. Yeah, my memory of Frankie is that he might have hosted Australian, uh, sorry, New Zealand Idol or something like that. And, he was in the music scene as well, maybe in the A&R department and things, but oh. he might have been one of the hosts on, on there as well, and old, his <laughs> older brother. But yes, he did. He was one of many. John and the band sort of you know, toured relentlessly for the debut album. They then sort of went away and then came back in uh, 1988, two years later, with the Touch album, which was fantastic. A little more stripped back sound, a little bit less production layers. Uh, a little more acoustic guitar stuff in it. The lead song off that album was called Touch, an unbelievable anthem song that's, I guess in Australia in 2004 became, if, if I could say this sort of tastefully, became the song of the tsunami because it was a charity fundraising song and there was a tsunami concert and that song sort of became almost like the, you know, rebirth of fundraising for the tsunami victims. The Touch album had uh, that as the lead single. It had Voice of Reason, Simple Man, In My Youth and a bunch of others. That album was produced by a guy called Chris Kimsey, who had worked on Full Moon Dirty Hearts, you know, uh, doing some remixes on Full Moon Dirty Hearts. He worked with the Stones. Uh, that album did quite well in Europe. Noiseworks toured, toured Europe in 1988 and 89 there. Eventually, they came back to Australia and, you know, uh, worked on their next album, which was the Love vs. Money album. This is my favourite album of theirs. I remember seeing them play live at Parliament House in Melbourne to launch the album. There was 20,000 people out in the streets. It was fantastic. Uh, that album barely has a dud song on it. But unfortunately, within about six to 12 months of that album coming out, cracks in the band appeared. There was a bit of a divisiveness. There was the Stuart and John... And, and the Kevin Nichols, I think, um, the drummer, who were up against Justin and Steve Belby, who were the other two guys who were split down the middle. There were sort of factions there. It led to the band sort of ultimately choosing to, to, to break up, you know, in that March 92, right, 93. They did a, a Best Of album came out. They did a cover of Let It Be from the Beatles. And effectively, they went their separate ways. And the other two guys went on to set up their own sort of band. Uh, Justin ironically went on to go overseas and work with the Arcade Fire and Silverchair and some of these big bands in a production sense. Uh, Justin's married to a lady called Nick Acosta, who is the lady who sings New Sensation on the original Sin album. So, you know, there's another in excess link there. But, you know, John, you know, suddenly becoming sort of, I guess, a, a solo artist was quickly snapped up in 1992 to join the Australian version of Jesus Christ Superstar. Which uh, I guess, but you got to Australia in '94, didn't you? Was that right? Was that the year you got here? No, 2004. Oh, sorry, 2004. Okay. Well, Jesus Christ Superstar. I guess I'm sure probably in the West End it probably had. It's probably still being played over there. The Andrew Lloyd Webber stuff for Australia, at least that that musical had you know was the biggest thing in Australia for about 12, 18 months there. What it did for John? Did he play? Uh, he played Judas. <laughs> Yeah, and obviously some of the the the, uh, the major songs off that album are like Everything's All Right, which was the major single. They had Jesus Christ Superstar, which he sung on that. And John nailed it. He probably stole the show. That production had Kate Sobrano, who played Mary Magdalene. It had John Farnham. Oh, yes. It was so huge. Seen photos. Is, so is there any footage of this on to on the Oh, yeah. There'd be... The, the big, that album was so big that it kept Welcome to Wherever You Are off number one in August 92. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> but what it did for John a little bit was it just sort of showcased just him as a, as a performer outside noise works. It gave him a little bit of a, a, a personal profile, which happens when you sort of become either solo or you're part of something different from a band entity. It then led to sort of John getting involved back to recording his solo album, his first solo album in 1994. Uh, which had a couple of hits off it in Australia. The one song that is fantastic called Reflections, 
which is a massively catchy classic song that um, John could be particularly proud of. Uh, that obviously was a, a stepping stone for him towards, you know, as I said, post Jesus Christ Superstar and then move, emerging into sort of a solo entity for himself. Uh, we spoke in a few recent episodes, B, didn't we, about him teaming up with John Farris to record a song called Carry the Flame for right. the Olympics. Yes. And I think we may have even posted that song on one of our end of episode uh, tributes, I think. I'm sure um, we have. Mm. Yeah. So around 1999, sort of he, him and uh, John Farris connected, both called John, both don't have H's in their name, so there's obviously a similarity. <laughs> Again, the Australian music industry in excess were, if I could use uh, mafiosa terms, they were the godfather of Australian music, okay, and uh, Noiseworks were probably one of the emerging bands underneath that were very inspired by in excess's success. John had always had a lot of respect for the band. I think a lot of the touring bands at that time, like the Hoodoo Gurus and, and Cold Chisel, maybe a little bit earlier, the Oils and Crowder House and all these ones, Having seen In Excess really take it to that next level was something that was quite inspiring, albeit competitive, and even jealousy sometimes amongst the bands. In Excess had gone global, and not many Australian-born acts and artists had, had gone to that level. So I guess, you know, with Michael's passing and with the passage of some three years, and the band had gone through the Terence Trentabi, you know, one-off show. Uh, they'd had uh, Susie DiMarchi do a show with them. They were starting to find their feet again as towards touring. You know, the band did ring up John and asked if, you know, he would come and play with them. And uh, the band were just, as, as we said in previous episodes, coming off the Tim Rice extravaganza. I think they were feeling better about themselves. They were, had probably made the decision we're going to, you know, progress and we're going to keep going. And when John did get the call up, B, he, w- he had about like a day or two to rehearse 20 songs for the Mercury Lounge gig. And he joked, well, I don't need to rehearse them. The whole world knows these songs, etc." cetera. But I'm still sure the lyrics, you know, we, you know, even you and I, we'd probably forget half the lyrics anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and remember the lyrics is not easy with 20 songs in about 48 hours. <laughs> no, he did uh, well. <laughs> I, I think the band said, look, it took Terence Trindarby a week to, to learn four songs and maybe not remember all the lyrics, poor old Johnny came and had to learn 20 in about two days. That so, just shows you the calibre of the man. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, look, just fast-tracking a little bit, you know, uh, we, we have spoken in previous episodes that, you know, John's first gig was at the Mercury Lounge in May 2000, and then that was sort of followed up, you know, a week or two later in Sydney with those uh, songs being played. The thing that I remember quite vividly around this time, B, was that there was, in 2001, around May, there was an announcement called a Just for Kicks tour, and this was a northern New South Wales slash uh, Queensland border tour of about eight to ten dates. Now, Matthew Marsden's done some posts on this in the past about all the various gigs, but I found myself be snapping up a couple of tickets, flying up to Tweed Heads and Coolangatta and seeing the band play at the Tweed Heads gig with John for the very, f- uh, well, not for the first time, for the second time, seen them at the Mercury Lounge a year ago, going to see them as more of an entity, more as a, as a group. And then I stayed at that hotel overnight and I remember going downstairs the next day and I went to the concierge and as I went to the concierge, there was a gentleman who sort of didn't quite push in front of me, but he asked the concierge for a, uh, a telephone book. Remember those things, Bernie? No. <laughs> remember, the, remember those things called telephone books? Yeah. Kids, if you don't know what one is, ask your parents. But uh, <laughs> uh, this gentleman was handed the yellow pages and he looked over my direction and said, thank you for letting him get served first. And that was Andrew Farris. Oh, Yes, and Andrew was trying to work out, you know, the way down to the next gig, you know, maybe where the accommodation was. I don't know. It was it was something along those lines. If it was me now, B, I would have said, "Hi, oh, Andrew, let me buy you a coffee. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> let me give let, you a lift. You know, a bit like Richard Lowenstein when I saw him down in South Melbourne. I got out of the car and ran after him. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you spin around in the car? <laughs> I, I would have done a hard tag on Andrew. I'm sorry, Andrew, I, I need to pull you aside here. You. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the Just for Kicks tour was great. I, I went down to the Ballina gig. I, I was I was nearly going to go into the Coffs Harbour one, but uh, I, had I heard to... it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go down to that one, but I just found from time constraints, I thought, well, it's another couple of days and then getting back or whatever. So I, I just did the two. But I think from memory, seeing John and the band there, as I said, they were doing these regional tours. There wasn't a lot of pressure on them. It wasn't like the Mercury Lounge where every, everyone, you know, was trying to find out, you know, the first gig after Michael. It was sort of a, a way of a band just sort of cutting their teeth a little bit in some regional markets with, without a lot of expectation and without a lot of fanfare. Again, the band had come off, you know, closing the Olympics with John sort of uh, some six months earlier. 
I guess, you know, you could sense that they, the camaraderie was there, you know, they, they had a friendship that was built anyway, and you could see a good rapport on stage, you know, with them a, as an entity. Joining in excess was it's one of those things, you know. Now, when I first played with them, it was basically me helping my mates out. There's a lot of pain there. Michael committed suicide, you know. I knew how those boys felt because, you know, one of my brothers committed suicide six months prior to Michael, so I just knew exactly where they were. One of the, my proudest things for me is that, you know, I helped them regain their confidence. And just, you know, say, you can, you guys can do it again, you know, if you want it, if you really want it, you know, I'll support you. If we fast forward to early March 2002, I think management at the time, now we've got to remember this, Chris Murphy wasn't managing the band at this time. The band were able to snare a US tour, both throughout sort of the, you know, the continental sort of America there, and then also going into Latin America, uh, where, you know, they had a very big sort of following. Plus, they were also able to include, you know, a, a European sort of uh, stop off there. And I think they booked something like 55 gigs there where they did that Night of the Proms tour that I've mentioned a few times before in Belgium and Europe. They did obviously America there. They did Latin America. And I think they were joined on tour with, with maybe Midnight Oil and the American leg there as well. The thing about that particular time there is that I think they announced in March 2002 that John was now officially a member of the band. I think management and the band probably wanted to go overseas with a united front saying, is he in the band or not? Give us the answer. And I think for, for John's security point of view, he'd been, you know, touring around for 18 months and doing things. To go on a tour overseas, it was probably a, a comforting thing to go, I'm part of the band. Yeah. Rather than just the guest singer and things like mm. that. The issue I think that sort of came up though, and, you know, which we'll talk about in a moment, was I guess the fact that they, the management of the time, were really putting out so much material of greatest hits and reworkings of greatest hits. And we've talked about those last two, you know, Shine Like a Dozen, the year specials. But there was another three or four, you know, repackaged albums that were coming out. You know, with all this stuff going on, you know, we saw some lovely footage there, which I have to thank a friend of the podcast for, for sending my way, Catherine, who uh, showed that footage, I think, Andrew and Kurt playing at the Rhino launch of Shine Like It Does. Did yes. you see that? Yes. Yeah. So big thank you to Catherine for finding that. I did try to allude to that that happened. I think I might have mentioned it was Tim and Kurt, but as it was, it was Andrew and Kurt. But I think for John, you know, from a creativity point of view, John was 41, 42 years of age and he had a, you know, thirst to, you know, want to create some new material. You know, I'll park that for the moment, but that probably was a contributing factor to, to how things ended. What I'd like to talk positively about, B, was what did John bring to the band and what was the vital things that John, I think at that time, was able to bring? Well, I've written these things down here, you know, and I've thought about these things. You've got a list, Hayden, have you? I've got a list, yeah. <laughs> I think he bore compassion and positivity. John yes. Stevens is one of the most positive guys when you've seen speak and talk and whatever. Yes, agree. He knew that the band of brothers in excess had lost their other brother, Michael, mm -hmm. and he knew they were wounded. And I think to John's credit, you know, he came in with a sense of compassion, positivity, and said, come on, guys, let's get this thing going. You're fantastic. And sometimes you need our external voices reminding you of your capabilities. Yeah. And I think that was a great asset at that time. John's vocal strength, you know, it can't be underestimated. We've marveled at Michael's sort of vocal inflections and nuances and cadences that he's been able to put on so many different songs. John had a bigger set of pipes than, than Michael did in terms of range, but John uh, was able to navigate the subtleties that Michael had particularly well with the material and the songs. And I think that became a really good fit. I think John had a passion for the material. He knew the material a lot, being a fan of the band, um, which meant learning sort of uh, the exact lyrics wasn't as hard as uh, it was for Terence. You know, the fact that John's playing their material to this day means, you know, he's a, still a fan of the material. John's enthusiasm and attitude overall, like I, I do remember seeing on stage, particularly with the other band, band members was infectious. John's a leader. He's led a band before. He knows what it's like to be the guy responsible. So he knew the shoes he was sort of trying to fill. And I think the biggest thing was a sort of a sense of healing to what was an unconfident band. You know, the band weren't confident. I don't think the label were confident. I don't think management were particularly confident because how could you be after Michael passed? Mm -hmm. You know, no one could say, we're really confident now. We've just lost, you know, our star attraction. I think that's the, the breach that John was able to bring in, that without John, there wouldn't have been a Switch album. Without John, there probably wouldn't have been more tours and, and more in excess through the I just wish he'd stayed. I just wish they'd let him... Right, more. What I'd like to add to your list yeah. is that he was 
Antipodean. Yes, I know bad words. <laughs> right, which, which is that, which is our Australian New Zealand sort of. Yeah, uh, and I think that really, it really, it needed to great seeing Terence, but it still felt not well, right. Yeah, I think one of us in excess, particularly the homeland, we were all patriotic about our band, um, mm. and we, you know, probably wanted to have that flag bearer from our Australian you know, New Zealand region and. John's an Australian citizen, so he's both a Kiwi and an Aussie now these days and has been for a long time. But yeah, I, I think John, you know, John just knew what they were going through. He knew their heritage. He'd seen their ascent. He'd seen the descent post Michael. And I think he was coming in, as I said, with a sense that he, he was, you know, effectively a, a healing voice and a healing person to be around. And obviously his relation with John Farris was close. And I think that would have sort of helped too, that there's a friendship and a camaraderie that sometimes is, you know, the Australian way, you know, our mates helping our mates out. Uh, Not, and that's what we're about. And the other week when I met him, I actually saw that firsthand when I mentioned in excess to him. I could see his lo- eyes lit up. I love yeah. these guys. You know, he was just so happy to talk. Goes, yeah, I'll come on the show. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is fantastic. All we- these decades later and he still wants to be part of yeah. it. So if we fast forward to 2003, you know, um, the, the Rugby World Cup, uh, Union World Cup was on in Sydney and the band had signed, uh, you know, with John a sort of a contract to record a song, you know, for that soundtrack or that particular EB Games things that was going on at the time. And uh, the song was called I Get Up, which uh, I know Pedro, one of our patrons and long-term listeners, uh, loves that song, was a, a pretty cool song and contribution. Unfortunately, though, really not long after that, it was announced that John was leaving the band and now, to give some context around that, there was, you know, a sense of, you know, possible acrimony uh, around that. I think there was a rumor going around. It was a bit like, you know, the, the new guy better get a lawyer and things like that. I think John, in, in future quotes and future interviews, has sort of uh, quashed some of those sort of acrimonious type sort of attitudes and things and saying, well, listen, don't believe everything you read. There's some couple of factors sort of that were there. Now, let me take it from John's point of view first. I think he was at a point where he wanted to create new material and write and do more stuff management the band they had them on you know these sort of greatest hits tours you know these these package tours overseas uh these reissues all this type of stuff which in a way for a band you know they were treading water you know creatively john knew that you know john probably had a thirst for material i think the day after he finished up with the band he wrote a song you know and he just wanted to be get some stuff down like you know he was okay maybe for 18 months two years about you know consolidating getting the band back to sort of together again but he felt like there was a point where they needed to suddenly go, okay, let's start, let's start writing some stuff. You're in here this morning, not so much to talk about that, but to talk about your plans for the future. And Yes. You have a, a pretty big announcement to make. I do indeed. Um, pretty much at the end of the year, I'll be moving on to other things uh, with my solo career and various other music projects. Um, so, yeah, I'll finish up with an excess at the end of the year. So this is the first time you've said this publicly. publicly John Stevens yes. is leaving in excess. Yeah, moving on, making music, you know, three and a half years to make one single, so I want to make albums. It's a big decision to make. It is, and I'm very nervous about it, but, uh, you know, you've got to move on, yeah. You joined the band how long ago? Uh, three and a half years ago, actually, yeah. Um, and we've done a lot of stuff. We've been mainly touring internationally, and, uh, you know, as I said, we've, we've recorded a lot of stuff, and it's just seems to be kind of going around a bit of a circle so you joined the band what two and a half years after michael died it yeah. was obviously the guys were obviously shell-shocked after that yeah. they they did gigs with terence trent darby they were scouring the world looking for singers they invited you to join the band <laughs> what did you think was going to happen at that time and what, what, well, what were I mean, your expectations for me at that stage it was just basically helping mates out you know it's like the wounded duck theory you help you know get get them all back together you know and now that it's all back together for, for, for the guys, um, for me, it's, you know, I just need to do some other stuff. Well, there are frustrations, obviously, John. It hasn't turned out the way you, you would have liked it to. Um, no, on a creative level, no. Um, but that's something that, you know, time will, time will tell for, for both parties, I guess. You wanted to record, tour, and really take things on further. You, you, you're frustrated it hasn't... Well, you know, being in a band, you're you're, you're susceptible to, you know, too many chiefs now, Indians. So, you know, for me, you know, being in Noiseworks for years, uh, that was my band, it was my music. And, um, you know, it was a very, very satisfying experience. So I guess, you know, from a creative point of view, that's pretty much, you know, what's going on there. 
Michael Hutchins left some pretty big shoes to fill, didn't he? Uh, it's, hey, we can't take it away from Michael, he's a man. <laughs> There was rumours at the time, and again, I, I can't sort of totally clarify with 100% accuracy, but there was some suggestions that maybe between Andrew and John, the chemistry of writing together probably wasn't as high as it wanted to be for Andrew. And, you know, I don't think that's a reflection of John so much. I think probably Andrew, you know, who had always worked with Michael um, to go suddenly work with another songwriter and who was a strong songwriter in John, and John played more instruments than Michael, Maybe there just wasn't that sort of chemistry in writing that meant Andrew sort of felt like that it may not be the fit they needed to go forward. But that's probably only something the two of them in the same room or, you know, individually speaking could probably answer. But that was suggested at the time. They came out um, with that beautiful song, though, the Brother. What's that? Where is my brother? They wrote that together then, didn't they? I don't know what that song is. Yeah, Andrew wrote it not so long ago, put it on his album, but him and John... Oh, Okay, it, it, about one of the songs that they'd written together back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Did Andrew put that on his country album, did he? Mm. Okay. But cool. he wrote it with John Evans. Ah, uh, yes. They okay, wrote cool. it together. Mm. Cool. I also think at the time, you know, we didn't have the stewardship of, uh, of a Chris Murphy. Now, you know, whether it was David Edwards or Martha or whoever was involved really managing the day-to-day stuff at that time. And I know a friend of the podcast, Darren Jones, who was very active around that time, who we may have come on to today episodes just to fill some little blanks in in the next couple of weeks you know there wasn't that sort of you know uh, stewardship of a chris murphy at the time probably spearheading sort of a plan and a band uh goal like if, if, you, if we think back to chris murphy all we think about is whiteboards and strategy and and all those type of things and you know it's no coincidence that once he got back involved with the band the success suddenly picked up for them again so you know i guess at this particular point you know we had john who ultimately was going to leave the band uh, as I said, the creativity side of things was was something that was a little bit low. If you do go to YouTube, though, you can find, particularly in South America, John singing Hungry, which is a great version that was ultimately sung by JD off the Switch album. There's another song that John sung called Sugar that was uh, well-received live that is on a lot of the platforms. So there was obviously some material that they were sort of putting together that did see the light of day, albeit with JD, et cetera. There. You know, for John, as I said, you know, he was probably just getting a little bit bored, you know, in the end and wanted, you know, if it wasn't going to take the next step, you know, creatively speaking, you know, maybe he was better off just to go pursue his other interests, which ultimately he did. In terms of the word rift, no, you know, I guess it probably was difficult when you separate because I think John probably had aspirations for something bigger. But they've obviously, you know, over the years remained good friends. You know, I think there's footage of Andrew and John playing together at the Farm Relief concert a few years ago uh, here in Australia. You know, John's touring the Inexcess material these days with Andrew's blessings in many ways. As you said, you know, through a lot of the interviews that John's done about the Inexcess tour, that he's doing now with their material plus noiseworks. He speaks very fondly and, and very positively about his days, you know, with the band and just the strength of the material. Um, I guess overall, B, I think as you sort of said before, I think in some ways it's just a bit of an opportunity that they lost, you know. You know, this is a true true story. The week after Michael passed and people asked me who's going to be the new singer when people said, I said, look, they've always went on and continued. I love the big John Stevens. Why? Well, he wasn't in a band at the time. He was in a band called Noiseworks previously, which was one of my top five bands. Interestingly, I thought, well, take a great singer, take a great band. Maybe that could be a mix. Ironically, three years later, it happened. <laughs> but I think maybe just the timing of how it was all happening and the nature of where, you know, it just took in excess a long time, that, that is the five remaining band members, to recover, to want to go out and have another crack at it again. And when I say have a crack at it again, I mean... Not go do country tours or do a few little side tours and things like that. Go out and put your name on the neon lights. Go put an album out. Go do Rockstar in Excess. Whatever it was, it took them really seven or eight years after Michael to really get their mojo to have a crack at reliving it again. Because it's not easy to climb the mountain twice. Mm. And I just don't think that they had that level of motivation to do that when John was around. And I think John, at that point, did have that motivation. Yeah. So... It just was a timing issue, I think, B, that ultimately went against them. Yeah, yeah. He wanted it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, as I said, you know, there's no, there's no sort of um, sort of uh, accusations who's right or wrong here. I just think this is sort of really the the, the circumstances why it didn't sort of continue. Because I still to this day get a lot of people say, oh, John Cena should have stuck around. Why didn't that happen? He was really good. I would have seen him. Um, but I think just as we've outlined today, you know, the stars didn't quite align in terms of the ambitions. You know, look. Two, three years later, suddenly in excess, are touring the world again, having top 20 albums in America, you know, top 40 hits with off Switch, you know, selling, you know, lots of their back catalogue, 
and then Chris came along and then rejuvenated things. And you know, we had a they had another wave of success in terms of their career, the mini series and other things there. So, but look, we look forward, and as we've said a bit earlier, but we have reached out to management. You've said taken to John individually. We've uh, we reached out to management. Uh, we've got tacit approval that John possibly will join us on for an episode. Um, and we'll tag, you know, I guess, in, and consolidate some of these questions there, you know, with him at the time and to see whether they do stack up to his version of events to be. Exactly, exactly. And um, beyond as well, I hear that he actually was part of the Dead Daisies. Yeah, well, look, you know, as I said, he uh, Dead Daisies was a sort of a band I run put together by Frank Lowy, the son, uh, sorry, Frank Lowy's son. Um, Frank was the guy who created Westfields in Australia and overseas and around the world. Uh, but it's like this sort of super group before they were a super group thing and it had members of Guns N' Roses in it and a whole bunch of things. But, you know, and then John went off to do some uh, recording with Dave Stewart for one of his solo yeah. albums. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, he's sung live with Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden mm-hmm. uh, for, uh, you know, uh, Highway to Hell. He's going to have some great stories, isn't he? Yeah. yeah John, John, I mean, John and Billy Joel are great friends and John's a bit like this sort of um, superstar that the world doesn't quite know about. Totally. Yeah, I get that. I mean? yeah. yeah, but he can still to this day sing the lights out. You know, it's one of those things that he's got those big sort of Scottish pipes, you know, lungs there. He's got a big broad voice. You know, he's a big, you know, merry guy. He's, you know, he's got that fantastic vocal range and a bit like Tom Jones. He's sort of almost like I was going to like yeah. that. Very he's like those, Tom Jones. Yeah, he's got those earthy sort of natural sort of. You know, and a good-looking guy, too. We have not mentioned how handsome the man is. That's your domain, but he's got those earthy sort of origins there from a, from humble beginnings. And like Tom, <laughs> he's probably had a few knickers thrown his way in his time. I, I bet. Well, I think I think there might have been a pair of... Or not not mine, not <laughs> mine. <laughs> well, I heard he picked up the initials and saw, saw on the knickers. I said, oh, what are those? What's that? B.H.? Richard Hewitt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, but B, uh, yeah, that's a sort of, well, you could always say part one of John Stevens, maybe part two will be him coming on and, and talking uh, a little bit about uh, his in excess connections. Please, John. That was a bit of a surprise there. Uh, we haven't even interviewed him on the show yet, and he's already doing little stingers for us. I know, he's, he's eager to come on. I can't wait to have Toby on, another good-looking rooster.